Okay, folks, welcome to 2023. Happy New Year. And what we're going to talk about today is, A, tonight we're going live. It's going to be Monday Night Futures Live, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please join us. And we will talk about the events that will shape the market as you proceed into the first half of 2023. I'm sending this out as a courtesy to everyone, not just our members, but to everyone. And what we do here each weekend, even though today's Monday, is that we review the closing price action of the weekly charts. We talk about our trades, our strategy, and how we plan on proceeding into the, the new trading week. Now, this week, it's a bit different because we've closed out not just a week, but we've closed out a month. So we're going to talk about monthly charts to get a feel for how did we close out the month because what we want to do is take a look at the markets from a macro perspective, that 100,000 foot view. Now, if you're a day trader, that 100,000 foot view may be a daily chart. But in the case of us being swing traders and position traders, we want to know the macro trend. How are things shaping up so we increase our probability of profit? Because knowing where the macro trend is tells you what direction you should be trading. I mean, we are contrarians, but that doesn't mean we, we trade against the trend. Now, if the trend gets extreme overbought, extreme oversold, then that's a different story. That's when our contrarian instincts kick in and we go big against the trend. So the first thing I want to talk about is a trade that we put on, and this is using our contrarian trading strategy, and that is Tesla. Nobody wanted Tesla. Nobody but nobody wanted Tesla, if you can imagine that. I was looking on Twitter, I'm seeing price targets of 70, 80. I said, no, it's not going to probably go down there immediately. It could, for all I know, they have earnings coming up in the back half of this month. We have no crystal ball, but in the short run, given the fact that on a daily time frame that Tesla had RSI with a 16 handle, actually 15 handle, that in all probability we were going to get a counter trend rally and a ruthless one at that. So what did we do? Well, we already had a position using a strangle and a straddle on Tesla, meaning that we wrote the options or we sold premium. And when you sell premium, you are the casino, not the gambler. So what I decided to do was when we saw RSI below 20, I said, let's, let's take a look at the monthly charts. Let's go back, monthly chart, and where might we see a bounce? Because I wasn't believing Twitter. Everybody was saying it was going down below sub 100 prior to the, to the resolution of RSI being down below 20. That's extreme oversold. That's where our contrarian instincts kicked in and said, no, 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 no. We are going to buy Tesla here. But where was the magic number? And that magic number was right around here. Not where this line is in general, but where you did an overshoot to the downside. And the lows of September 2020 at 109.96 held, at least in the regular hours trade. In the pre-market trade, prior to us rallying back, we hit 104 spot 2.2. And our price target was between 100 and 104. So good enough for government work. And we booked half profits on a rally. We are still long of Tesla. I'm looking for a continuation move up higher here. But we're going to sell that rally well before earnings. And the options expire on the 20th of January. So our options trades will have either A, been closed out, or B, expired worthless prior to earnings. And we'll reestablish an earnings trade, but with a risk-reward parameter uh, far greater than where we're at right now. So, uh, members, more to come on our earnings trade strategy for Tesla. Now, let's segue over and into the bond market first. And for those out there whose eyes just gla glazed over, I know the members are not those that are glazing over. If you're a non-member, if you are new to technical analysis, if you're new to trading, even if you are experienced to trading and just... Go by your gut instinct. If you're ignoring the bond market, you do so at your own peril. You must know the direction of yields in order to trade this market with the highest probability of profit. That is why we begin with bonds, bond yields first. And what are the charts telling us about 
yields. Are they going higher? Are they going lower? Well, if they go higher, you know that in all probability, equities are going to move lower, in particular your high beta tech stocks. And what this chart of the 10-year yield monthly time frame tells us that we flashed a bullish key reversal bar, meaning we put in a new monthly lower low only to see buyers below bidding the yield back above or selling the bond, which trades inversely of the yield, and selling bonds off, bidding yields up higher. So this is a pretty bullish chart. So what we want to keep an eye on in the first few weeks of 2023 is this. Do we break out? Right. If we break out, I suspect that what we're going to see is a considerable amount of selling pressure in equities. And when you take a look at bond prices, this is of the exact opposite, the, the inverse mirror image of yields, right? So let's go back, bond yields, bullish key reversal bar, bond prices, bearish key reversal bar. And these candlesticks, if you are not a member and you're not familiar with technical analysis, I have a five-part video tutorial with my top five favorite candlestick patterns. Use the link below in YouTube or on the website and you'll get that five-part video tutorial free of my top five favorite candlestick patterns. More about the bond market. These are tips. Treasury inflation protected securities. How did they perform in the month of December? Not good. We had a dead cat bounce only to get resolved with a bearish key reversal bar yet again. So what we want to do here is take our crayon out and say, okay, the market has sent us a signal that we have a clear and defined downtrend channel that has not changed whatsoever. So as you proceed into the new trading year, the tip market is predicting that the Federal Reserve is going to be aggressive. They are going to fight inflation. Therefore, why would you need a Treasury inflation protected security? That's the mindset. Now, if the Federal Reserve slips up and they say, okay, we're going to pause here. We are going to cut rates. Even though inflation has not been tamed, you're going to see the tips rip through the ceiling. We're not there yet. If anything right now, the tip market is looking as though it's a short now, the dollar, we went into the year extremely bullish, meaning 2022, and we closed out the year very, very bearish. Now, we were accumulating gold mining stocks, silver, silver mining stocks through this rally up higher. And to be honest with you, it was a contrarian trade. And we legged in, sold covered calls when we needed to because the dollar was so strong and the dollar trades inversely of our gold mining stocks, gold, silver, etc. But we were accumulating on weakness of the gold stocks, silver mining stocks, etc. So what's the dollar telling us as we proceed into the new trading year? In all probability, we are going to go lower. I'm eyeballing 27 on the dollar bull ETF. If you're looking at the Dixie basket, I think that we're heading down to 102, quite possibly to 101. Before we head down to that level, we may see an attempted rally back to recapture 104. But I believe that that rally is going to fail and ultimately will get resolved down here at around, let's call it 101. Because the Japanese yen, which is the second largest component relative to the dollar in the Dixie basket, they are raising taxes rather than going to the bond market, the debt market, to satisfy their spending needs. You have the Eurozone that is raising rates. I mean, going into 2022, the United States was the only game in town threatening to and or raising interest rates in the entire G20. That all changed in the back half of 2022, which is why you saw the dollar take it on the chin. The VIX, monthly time frame. For the month of December, no great shock, the VIX closed up. We do have a big topping tail here. I have been of the mind for quite a while now, and I've said this explicitly, constantly, ad nauseum, that we have not seen the blow-off top necessary to call a bottom in this market. I think that there's a very, very strong probability that 2023 is the year. Why? 
It's because the yield curve is telling us that. It's beginning to steepen. We're going to be talking about the yield curve as we do pretty much in every live stream now tonight. Again, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join us. Click the like notification bell and you get alerted when we go live. In fact, I have a list down below you can opt into to get alerted 15 minutes to a half hour prior was going live. Do not subscribe to that email list if you are already subscribed to our five-part video tutorial because I send out an alert when we go live to everybody on that list as well. So I don't want to spam you. So please only enter your email address once. Now the the chart that has me most concerned here about the VIX, even though that the stokes are weak, rolling over down below 50, what's the what does the stochastic mean? Uh, it means it's momentum. It's a momentum indicator. And what is momentum telling us on the VIX right now? It's weak. It's it's breaking down on RSI, which is another momentum indicator. It's weak. I mean, we rallied and it faded. What what I always like to say when stokes are declining down below 50, rallies tend to fade. What happened last month? The rally faded. Yes, we closed higher, but it faded. If you were shorting the market on the VIX breaking out above 25, well, you got hurt. Respect your momentum indicators. They tell you a story. Now, the chart that has me most concerned is not the monthly chart, but the quarterly chart. And this concerned me all through 2021, 2022. But this is a long-term cup with handle formation. And despite the fact on the quarter in Q4 that the VIX got clubbed over the head, the stochastics, the momentum indicators, hadn't changed much. Look at this decline on the VIX down nearly 31.5%, yet this formation, this cup with handle formation on the VIX is alive and well. And until such time as we see a blow off top, maybe I'll go over this again tonight on the live stream, uh, we will not be satisfied that we have a bottom in on this market because 2022 is not the type of price action that tells you that it's all clear, it's safe to go back in the water, buy your equities, adopt the 60-40 rule, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, buy and hold. No, that is not the way to trade this market. We are in dangerous territory, and the one word that you need to keep in mind to be successful in 2023 is the L word, liquidity. Do you have the capital reserves necessary to take advantage of either a short-term swing trades using options and most of the time we're selling premium with high probability of profit or do you have enough capital sitting in reserves also known as dry gunpowder to take advantage of the blow off top on the vex when the floor falls out of the stock market to go stepping in buying as we did with tesla when there's blood in the streets nobody wants equities do you have the capital? Have you survived the storm? And are you able to take advantage of this once in a decade opportunity that is approaching? Believe me, folks, I may sound bearish. I am not. We are preparing for the worst. But man, I can't wait until we get the blow off top on the VEX because all I want to do is just go stepping in, buying equities for the long term and watching them grow over the course of the next 10 years. But we need a flush out of the system. It's got to feel as though it was 2007, 2008, or during COVID, where there was a sense of hopelessness in the investing community at large. When you get that gut-wrenching feeling, that's when you know you're probably near a bottom and you need to start dollar cost averaging into the markets. Again, the, the, the key word for 2023 is going to be liquidity. Now, as we segue over and into the, the equity market, uh, we're going to begin with the Dow Transports, and there are a couple of indexes that I use as our canary in the coal mine for equities. One, the Dow Transports. Two, consumer discretionaries. Now, the Dow Transports are constant. They always remain a canary in the coal mine for equities because they usually lead the markets down or lead the markets higher. They signal tops, they signal bottoms, and eventually the markets follow suit. Why is that? They're economically sensitive. They're cyclical. The other chart we'll get to in a moment, which is consumer discretionary. Now, consumer discretionary generally has been a stalwart, a leadership group in the stock market, but that was not the case in 2022. They were a laggard. Why? The consumer is dead. We'll talk about 
that more in a moment when we get to consumer discretionaries. Let's begin with the Dow Transport. Now, on the month, they were down over 8.5%. Now, keep in mind that the upper band of resistance in blue and the lower band in blue as well of support, they have been tried and true. You short into that resistance level, you buy at support. Now, what did we do last month? Well, we attempted to break out to new monthly higher highs only to be rejected. This is bearish as we begin the new trading month. Now, to be fair, volume was very light. Now, we need to we need to rationalize this a little bit, right? Certainly, this is not a sign of institutional distribution. Might it be a sign that selling is waning? Could be. Could be. We, 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 we can't forecast what's in the minds of other traders. Or it could be the fact that we had an abbreviated month, a holiday month, where you had a lot of people just checking out. They closed out positions, lots of tax laws selling, and there just simply wasn't as much trading going on. And for all I know, those institutions or individual investors that sold 30 days ago, well, they could be buyers this coming week. So while this is a bearish candlestick, and normally I would say get ready to short, I would still say get ready to short with the caveat of, of beware of the January effect. We're going to talk about that tonight, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join us, the January effect. We have no idea, no idea of as to whether or not we're going to go walking in tomorrow morning and see a wall of buying or a wall of selling. Using this candlestick, it would imply that we're going to get lower lows, but we want to be humble. We do not want to draw any conclusions as of yet. It's a brand new year. There are dynamics in place that would possibly create a rally going into the new trading week despite the monthly price action of the monthly chart. Let's take a look at the weekly chart. Now, the weekly chart is not looking good here. We broke down the week before last. Did we see a tremendous amount of selling these past two weeks? You wouldn't think so. And no, we didn't because why? It was abbreviated weeks, right? So this coming week is going to be a major tell for equities, and it could quite possibly dictate how we trade for the remainder of the year. The Dow Jones Industrial Average. This is a monthly chart. Now, the Dow Jones broke out the month before last in November now, it's hard to see perhaps on your side, but we failed to hold this breakout point. So what we saw on the month was that Dow Jones failed to hold the breakout. Now, could this get resolved? Could we pop up higher and open above this upper band of resistance? Absolutely. We did not close all that far down below that support level. So we keep an open mind and we want to keep an open mind, especially when we have our stochastics, our momentum indicators rising and they are going in the right direction volume was not horrible for the month of december but it was below average let's go to a weekly chart here now the weekly chart not bad here two consecutive weeks of inside trade meaning we had this bearish reversal bar the week of december the 12th and each preceding week inside that trading range that could bode well for the dow jones moving into the new trading week now, moving on to the S&P 500 monthly chart, we did see a breakout and a recapture of support above 400 in November. But unlike the Dow Jones, it couldn't break through the upper band of resistance. Now, December, it as well could not hold the breakout. So this is still a bearish chart. We do have momentum beginning to rise, which is bullish. The however is, is that uh, technically speaking, I would have to give odds to bears on this monthly chart. That may change a bit as we drill down to a weekly chart. For all I know, they gap it up on Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever, up above this 380 mark. Where do we close? We close at 382. So let's call it 385, 390. And they open it above there, and it stays there. You know, we, 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 Again, we don't have a crystal ball. We want to respect the price action of the market and keep an open mind. Once you don't have an open mind, there's no way you can trade this market. Now, taking a look at the weekly chart, very similar to the uh, Dow Jones in that we have two back-to-back -back weeks of consolidation. What do we read into that? Well, it was light trade. It, 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 it was basically a non-event. We never, we never had a Santa Claus rally. That never transpired. Seasonality did not work out for us. My personal opinion was that we were seeing a tremendous amount of tax loss selling. 
Now, if that is the case and there is there was a large amount of tax loss selling, it leads one to believe that those sellers that sold 30 days ago are now going to be coming back into the market. Or I shouldn't say could. Could it be coming back into the market after that 30-day threshold and buying those shares back? Possibly at even a cheaper price than where they sold. Volume diminished dramatically over the past couple of weeks. But again, we expect that due to the holidays. The triple Qs. Now, this is your large cap tech. And I, I, I want to be bullish here. I cannot. The macro view of this market is not a pretty picture. We are in a downtrend, as all these charts are. While we had positive months in October and November, December, we gave the vast amount of that, those gains, I should say, those gains back. And as you could take a look here at RSI, RSI doesn't even have the strength, the momentum to close above 50. And in fact, we put in a double top below 50 and we're threatening now to break it down to new lower lows. Now, could this get resolved with a higher high? Sure, sure. We're not going into the new year saying, okay, uh, based upon a couple of light weeks worth of volume, which can manipulate or skew the market, either unrealistically bearish or unrealistically bullish, we're going to go into it with an open mind. And using our option strategies of, of selling premium, deep out of the money premium, we really don't care which way it goes. It doesn't matter per se. Our directional plays matter. We need to call them right. But in terms of our options premium business, selling premium, not buying premium, again, being the casino and not the gambler, the probabilities are vastly in our favor relative to the guy going in there buying call contracts or buying put contracts and hoping for the best. That type of trading is called hopium, and we prefer not to do that. Let's do a deeper dive, weekly view. I know this is a lot of spaghetti on this chart here, but uh, while the monthly chart is pretty bearish, this is not all that bearish. I, I think that what they're doing here is they're trying to put in a higher low. And whether or not they're successful enough, well, that'll be found out pretty early in January because they're going to have to defend this higher low. Now, if we fail, if we break down below the lows of October, then we're going considerably lower on the triple Qs. My guess is with earnings coming out over the course of the next month and a half, I think that they're going to hold it in check as best as possible. And the reason why I say that is that you had Nike that had come out, I believe it was either last week or the week before along with FedEx. And while they had ratcheted down, each of them ratcheted down their earnings considerably, both of the stocks rallied on earnings that were meh. Right, so we want to keep an open mind. We don't want to draw conclusions here. Let's respect the environment that we're going into. And that new environment is Q1 earnings. And we also have a Federal Reserve meeting coming up as well. Now, the small caps, I didn't really expect this. I, haven't, I don't follow the small caps as much as I used to. But my my gut instinct when I, when I saw this chart was that we would see much better price action. The reason is, is there's a recency bias. And when I was tracking the small caps back here in October, then in November, really strong price action relative to the large caps. In the month of December, they really gave way down 6.5%. So what I need to do here is I need to take a look at the small caps from a short perspective. And we'll take our crayon out. Here is quite possibly a bear flag setup. And if we break to new lower lows, well then, we need to short the small caps. And similar to the, I believe it was the Qs, we have a double top down below 50 on RSI. That being said, we have a momentum indicator, another one, giving us an opposite signal. This is why price and volume matter most. Your indicators matter second. And it is putting a higher low. So we'll see. Maybe they gap it up and it trades inside the body of December's candlestick. We don't know. And it consolidates and then it can move up higher. Weekly view. Again, two back-to-back -back weeks of indecision bars. Nearly uh, what you call doji star formation, sign of indecision. They're trying to put in a higher low here. Volume is just way too thin to join the conclusions. The banks. Now, the banks had broken out. This is very similar to the Dow Jones. 
Uh, it broken out in November, failed to hold the breakout point in December. Very bearish setup here. But the volume is very light. So, you know, it's very easy to manipulate. The algorithms can manipulate these markets very, very easily on thin trade. Weekly view. To me, this looks like a dead cat bounce with very, very light volume. And on all of these charts so far, folks, if I had to put my nickel down and say, okay, neutral is not an option. Do the markets go higher or do they go lower? I'd have to say, given the price action thus far that we've seen during this commentary, I'd have to say the path of least resistance remains lower. Technology. Again, uh, we are in a downtrend here. And this is why I, I, I say that the, the probabilities are that we move lower. The trend is clear and defined. There's no arguing the direction. The path of least resistance is lower until such time as we break out, consolidate, and then move up higher. Then the path of least resistance has since changed. Again, we may be contrarians, but we respect the trend because that's where the big money's flowing, either out of the market or into the market. Right now, it's flowing out. To think that we're going to be able to defy the laws of gravity is a bit nuts. Consumer staples. Clearly one of the top performing sectors of 2022. Does it continue? Quite possibly. Because unlike unlike uh, the Dow Jones, unlike the S&P 500, unlike the Qs, which all gave up breakout points, the staples did not. They broke out in November, as did the S&P, as did the Dow Jones. But unlike the, the two, uh, they held the breakout in December. So while it was a down month, technically speaking, they outperformed the other indexes on a relative basis. Weekly chart, let's see how we close out the week. Uh, we're consolidating here. So I'd have to say that uh, the trend, which is clear and defined, remains to the upside for 2023 consumer staples. Now, the same cannot be said for consumer discretionary. I mentioned this earlier. Now, while the stochastics, which are a momentum indicator, are pressing lower, are down below 20, are quote-unquote oversold. They can go lower, but ultimately we're going to get a counter-trend rally here. The question is, where do we get that counter-trend rally? Let's answer the question now. Let's update the chart, get our crayon out, and it could be a lot lower if we break to new lower lows. I think that 110 is not out of the realm of possibility on consumer discretionary names. Taking a look at RSI, we've seen this setup, double top, down below 50. This one has broken through to the downside. This is the third time we've seen this setup during this commentary. And remember, a lot of people are out there. They're using these stochastics for all the wrong reasons. Yes, they're oversold. This is the reason why people go broke. They read technical analysis for dummies. They say buy the stochastic or buy the stock when the stochastics go down below 30, which is ridiculous, 20, which is less ridiculous, what you want to do is you want to wait for a W formation. You want to see them hook up, then roll back over, then hook up yet again, put in a higher high relative to the prior peak, and that is the best risk-reward entry point when you're trading off of the stochastics. We are nowhere near that yet. So beware of the use of oversold on stochastics. This can easily break to new lower lows. I've seen more damage done to a stock, to an ETF, when the stochastics are down below 20 than any other point during this evolution of rising and declining. So beware. Weekly view. Weekly view, unlike the other indexes which have been trading sideways, we've been seeing lower lows on the discretionary names. The weak tend to get weaker. And this is the only index so far that we've gone over that is broken down below, not just the June lows, but the October lows as well. Volume, light. One thing I really haven't been touching upon here, but it'll, it'll, it'll be more important for the other averages in the coming weeks. You're moving averages. A lot of people try to dismiss this, but a lot of technicians use these. So if you dismiss what other people respect, well, you could be the one left with egg left on your face. So I don't talk about moving averages all that much. I, I prefer historical support, historical resistance. You can't ignore this. You have your moving averages going in all the wrong direction. The 20 period in green is down below the 200 period. The 50 period is going to be threatened to take out the 200 period. That keeps a lot of technicians on the sidelines until they get resolved, meaning they flatten out, they begin to cross back up yet again. We're nowhere near there yet. 
this sector continues to underperform. In fact, I have overlaid here in blue the S&P 500, and you can see the relative underperformance is clear and defined. Now, inflation was a major threat to the stock market in 2022. It caused the Federal Reserve to be far more aggressive than it has been in history. And does it look any better in terms of inflation on the food front going into 2023? In terms of price action, no, it looks pretty good. Meaning, food prices appear to want to move up higher. Now, we take our crayon out. There's our support level. Have we broken out? Yeah, we have. We broke out in the month of December. The thing to keep in mind, we have momentum, which has not fully gotten behind price yet. But it appears as though food prices in the new year are going to be strong with a bias to the upside stable with a bias to the upside perhaps that's a better way of saying it and this etf was one of the winners on a relative basis in 2022 could it be a winner in 2023 the chart is is early on saying yeah it sure can we're putting in higher lows where the equity market appears to want to put in lower lows now on the week a down week but man what a breakout the week prior to last. So food prices looking fairly bullish. The energy sector. Now, we have a short on the energy sector. I'm going to do a deeper dive here. We're going to talk about that trade in a moment because uh, last week the trade kind of went against us. We have a small loss here, and we may need to stop out, but let's talk a little bit about the whys behind why we would need to stop out technically and uh, fundamentally. So let's talk first about the technicals monthly time frame. We were down, the energy sector was down 3% on the month. We did rally off the lows of the month. We are fairly extended. And you can see here the correlation between energy and oil is very tightly correlated. So as goes oil, so goes energy. Now, MACD, extremely long in the tooth here, implying that we may see continued weakness on the energy sector. But that could take months. And it doesn't mean that we can't put in new higher highs. So we don't want to fight the market based upon what might be on a MACD. Drilling down, taking a look at a weekly chart. And obviously, before I go any further, obviously energy is one of the winners of 2022. Probably the, the best sector of 2022. Now, this is clearly a contrarian play. We were short back here. We called that right. We exited and we re-entered short last week. You could see that we did not break out on the week. If we do break out, we would need to stop out of the trade. Now, what keeps me kind of confident about the trade is that volume was extremely light. So this price action could be, could be, not definitely, could be a bit skewed. Now, why do we enter this trade and why am I concerned about it? Daily chart. So we shorted XLE right here. Why? Well, it had broken out. And I have even I even mentioned to members on Market Wrap. I said, "Listen, uh, I'm getting the feel that this may not hold. This breakout may not hold." And sure enough, the next day it failed to hold the breakout. We shorted then. The next day they tried to recapture it. It, it was rejected. Uh, but on Friday it managed to break out above. Why? This goes to the fundamental thought: China is reopening, and that's a valid, valid argument for saying you know what stay long of the xle but many times the narrative does not necessarily work out what do i mean by that well remember that when russia entered the ukraine that was in this is oil now that was in february of 2022 right here where are oil prices now they were expected to skyrocket to the moon because russian oil the largest producer in the war world came offline for at least Europe and the United States. Where are oil prices now? They are lower than where they were in February of 2022. So that's why I say, beware of the narrative. The narrative doesn't always play out. That's the story. CNBC, Fox Business News, they want to tell you a story for as to why you should do what you should do because it sounds logical. The however is, the markets know in advance what nuances are out there that could cause prices to move lower relative to the narrative? So that's why I always say be, beware of these slick back salesmen that go on TV and pump either sectors or 
stocks, they have an interest and that interest does not align with yours usually. Why are they giving it away free? Meaning their opinions. Now the price of oil on a monthly time frame, you could see the momentum indicator, weak, possibly trying to bottom out here. Same deal on RSI. Price action would apply that we're trying to bottom out here. Down volume, pretty benign, well below the moving average. Let's drill down to a weekly chart. A weak move up higher. Let's update our chart. There's our primary upper band of resistance, but I think that we may have broken out last week. Let's um, validate that. Yeah, we did. We broke out um, the week prior to last. So it looks as though we're going to get a bid on oil. So we may be stopping out of that XLE short as soon as Tuesday if we get a new higher high. So members, get ready for that. Small loss. We took our we took our chance on a good probability trade, a breakout point failure. We're identifying that the trade may not be working out. We raised capital, aka liquidity. We move to the sidelines, keep our losses small. We live to play another day. Boyle, we have a position on here. We sold puts on Boyle. A tremendous breakdown here. And again, this, this is a, the counter narrative. All right, you, you have uh, drilling, which is slowed in the United States. Russian not gas offline for at least Europe. Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2 pipelines blown up. Yet, yeah, wh where's the price of natural gas? Uh, we're at... Lowe's not seen since uh, mid-2021, uh, well before the Ukrainian invasion. Again, the, the, beware of the narrative. Beware of the narrative. Use the charts, not the narrative. How do we close out the week last week? It looks as though what we may be doing here is putting in a W formation. I wouldn't say it's quite time to go buying boil yet am I, am I okay with selling puts and reducing your basis cost sure i like that we are nearing unsustainable downtrend moves here but it can look it can easily move lower no doubt about it so beware look at this volume tremendous tremendous volume here let's bring up the ung this because boil is a trading vehicle and ung not so much so let's see what the volume was on ung and it wasn't as high. This is why we take a look at the volume bars here relative to Boyle. Again, Boyle is a trading vehicle. It's a leveraged ETF. You want to take a look at either the spot price volume or the ETF, non-leveraged ETF, to get a good feel for accumulation or distribution. Gold. Now, gold closed down on the year fractionally, but vastly outperformed the S&P 500. You can hear a lot of people saying, gold closed down last year. Well, so did the S&P 500. So did the Dow Jones. So did the, the, the triple Qs. Relative to those indexes, did you preserve buying power if you were in gold or your spending power? Yeah, you did. And it looks as though we are moving up higher in 2023. And what will drive gold prices higher dramatically is if, and this is what I predict is going to happen with the Federal Reserve is that we're going to need to see a Federal Reserve pivot at some point in time due to whatever catastrophe befalls us. All the catastrophes that are out there that people are speculating about, it's probably not the catastrophe that's going to cause this bubble to pop. Well, it's already popped, but cause the capitulation sell-off in the market that we really need to flush out the system. In all probability, it's going to need to be a series of bankruptcies large banks not the this, these crypto banks they're they're just drops in the bucket there needs to be liquidity issues and if the fed pivots i think what they'll do is this at current their inflation target is two percent if they raise that to three or four percent and claim victory and begin to pause or god forbid even cut rates yet again you are going to see gold rip through the ceiling because that would have me meant that the Federal Reserve has waved the white flag to inflation. Inflation has won, and there will be a rush to precious metals. and dust. Anything that you could drop on your foot and it hurts, people are going to want to buy. Because they're going to need tangible assets. The dollar is going to tank. Nobody's going to want that paper. 
Now, I have a chart of gold. I'm going to go over it tonight on Monday Night Futures Live. Again, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is going to blow your socks off. It's probably one of the most bullish charts out there. And when you look at it, you're going to be asking yourself the question, why am I not long of gold? So join us again tonight, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Weekly view gold. Now, weekly view, I'm not as bullish, to be honest with you. We're nearing resistance. You're seeing some selling pressure here. We may get a nice orderly pullback because you want to see a stair step higher. You don't want to see a straight shot higher because that's unsustainable. You need your charge to see a nice downward sloping sell-off very orderly and then a continuation move up higher and that sets you up for great entry points but right now topping action nearing resistance at 1850 so no great rush even though i'm very bullish on gold no great rush to go jumping in on tuesday morning our gold mining plays nugget finished the month down however on the quarter very much up and vastly outperforming the large caps. Weekly view. Much as what you, you, you're seeing on gold, it's playing out on uh, Nugget as well. This is a leveraged ETF putting you long of the large cap miners. Now, we're probably going to get a move lower. Is it out of the question that we just bust out higher? No, it's not out of the question. But clearly, the chart is telling you that you have resistance above. The best thing to happen here is that we get a either A, a pretty nasty sell-off and a bullish reversal bar, or B, we just drift sideways with a bias to the downside, and then we get a breakout. It relieves the pressure. You have a lot of overhead supply above, so consider this topping action an opportunity. Now, our junior mining play, the GDXJ, this is more of an investment vehicle. We have broken out above not just one but two resistance levels on rsi the stochastics are following suit on the month unlike the nugt the junior miners were up on the month and on the quarter outperformed now i would like to think that gold was the shining star pun intended of the year it was not silver outperformed gold by a wide margin and it looks as though we're going up higher. This is a leveraged ETF here. We are long of it. We've been long of it for a long time. On the month, again, leveraged ETF on the month, up 15 spot, 19%. Let's take a look at the SLV, non-leveraged product. It was up over seven and three quarters percent. Vast, vastly outperforming gold, which is up only two spot, nine, three percent. But I say only tongue-in-cheek because equity markets S&Ps were down five and three quarters percent so what we want to do here is again we're contrarians but we want to look for where the money's flowing the macroeconomics meaning Fed policy inflation geopolitical risk does it favor US equities or does it favor gold it favors gold it favors silver so silver will remain long of and will buy on pullbacks the silver mining stocks, of which we are also long of, they close down. They usually trade typically along with the gold mining stocks, so, so no great shock there. They were higher on the month, but they faded. I think that what we're going to get here is a higher low. So I, I'm not going to be the least bit surprised to see an orderly pullback, a higher low on both the gold mining stocks, silver mining stocks. And on that pullback and breakout, we'll be looking to add more. So again, if you're not currently a member, sign up. Weekly view. Yeah, very similar to the uh, gold mining stocks. Resistance immediately above. A lot of overhead supply here. No great rush. There's several ways to trade this. Sell naked puts, wait for a pullback, do both. Plenty of ways to make money in this market. Uranium. Monthly chart, we own it. It's been consolidating for several months now. We'll be looking to add more if and when we break out. They attempted to break out on, I should say the in, in, the, in the month of December, not on the month of December. Uh, they tried to break it out. It was rejected. Uh, stochastics continue to weaken here, so no great shock. Stokes trading down below 50. Rallies tend to fade. As long as you keep that in mind, 
That's the best use for me of the stochastics. Where are they? Are they trading down below 50? Are they trading up below 50? It increases your probability of profit. Weekly view. Now, the weekly chart here, I got to tell you, is looking pretty good. Uh, we had broken down on Stokes. They are now hooking back up. We are in a trading range on uranium. We reversed off the lows of the week of the 19th of December. And it looks as though they want to take these up higher. But we could spend another several weeks within this trading range consolidating. The longer the consolidation, the greater the validation of any breakout. I'm really liking uranium here. I was getting concerned about it. That concern has been abated somewhat. If we break down below the lows of the week of the 19th, I'll be out of this trade. But if we break out, well, I'm going to be adding more to uranium. Now, our biotech trade is LABU. LABU closed down. This is leverage ETF, so keep that in mind. Down over five and three quarters percent on the month. But it's been showing resilience, meaning... They've been trying to take it down. They've been bidding it off the lows for several months now. What I believe is happening here is that they're putting in a W formation. Here's the left side of your W. Pivot point is a 1319, which is the prior high. Now they're pulling it back. Bears are trying to take it down. Bulls are saying, no way, it ain't happening. And they're bidding it back up. I think that this gets resolved to the upside. So keep a close eye on biotechs in 2022. Weekly view. Taking a look at the weekly chart here, you got to love this. Cup, this, this handle has been forming for weeks now, and it looks as though it's getting ready to pop. Stokes have already popped. We're looking for higher lows and a higher high. We got it. Price action. Bullish key reversal bar on the week. Very, very tight consolidation. Again, I think this gets resolved to an explosive upside move. Bullish on biotechs. Emerging markets. Now, this is emerging markets X China. Emerging markets for the month of December down 5 spot to 1%. Now, we did see a breakout in the month of November. That breakout did not hold. In December. So I'm kind of disappointed in this price action. We are long looking to build more. So no great rush to go buying more EMXC right here, right now. Looking at the stochastics though, momentum indicators, momentum is beginning to trend higher. It's never a straight shot. Rarely is it a straight shot, I should say. Rarely. You're going to get your backing and filling. But it's clear that we are putting in higher lows. We have held the breakout from November, unlike the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones weekly view. Weekly view, we're holding 47. I am concerned about the 50 period rapidly approaching the 200 period moving average, no doubt about it. But what's key to EMXC is the US dollar. If the dollar continues to weaken up, we may just get a breakout on EMXC. So I'm not ready to go adding more here. But in the coming week and weeks, we will be adding more if price action improves some. Because when this market goes, I think that one of the areas that we need to be invested in is emerging markets, ex-China. You have a lot of companies leaving China in favor of India, Vietnam. We predicted this back during the beginning of COVID. Go back and check my videos back then. I said this supply chain disruption is not going to end well for China. I remain in that camp. And the valuations of emerging market stocks are very, very cheap. So do I suspect that if U.S. equities go through a capitulation sell-off, will emerging market stocks be spared? No, I do not. I think they will go down along with them. But their valuations are, are already attractive, whereas U.S. valuations are very expensive. So... What do I want to be? I want to be an aggressive buyer on any capitulation sell-off of emerging markets. Some shorts I like going into the new trading year, LNG, Chenier Energy, broke down. This is a monthly chart. Broke down below the lower band of support. Might they try to rally in an effort to try to recapture prior support? I expect it. But on that rally and a failed effort to recapture it, we'll be shorting LNG very aggressively. A stock I like is Coinbase. Now, on the month, it was 
hit hard. It broke down below support. I don't believe that we've seen the absolute lows yet. But this is a trading vehicle I like for selling premium. It's an innovative stock. If the shares are put to us, well, then we get them at a, at a reduced basis cost. I am not of the mind that because crypto has gone through a crypto winter and FTX and all the shenanigans that have gone on, I, I do not believe that Bitcoin or Ethereum, the majors are going away. So it's during these time frames. If you're an investor, you want to be looking at these names and buying when really nobody else wants them. And when you look at this chart, everybody wanted Coinbase back here, 368 bucks, 90 cents, ridiculously overvalued. Nobody wants it down here. That's our contrarian instincts kick in. We say, okay, let's let's play the game. Let's play the game. Let's make some money here. Weekly view. Now, in a weekly view, it's looking good. I think we're going to rally here fairly soon on Coinbase. Nice tide consolidation. As with any stock, they have earnings coming up. So be aware of when that earnings report is. Amazon stock. I think that Amazon is a top tier name. Let's face it. They're putting malls out of business. And while I think that we could quite possibly press lower, that we're nearing support levels that are at least tradable to the upside. Amazon was down nearly 13% on the month, on the year. It was down 49 spot, 50%. Think about it. But where do we close out the month? Right at support from January 2020. Google, monthly view. I don't own these, these stocks here, folks. These are just stocks I'm just browsing through. I'm interested in. Google was down over 12.5% on the month, on the year. Down just over 39%. Not quite an outside reversal bar, but pretty darn close versus the prior bar. And this is a yearly chart. Let's go back to the monthly chart. Why, do I, why am I interested in here? We're in a very tight wedge formation. Technically, it closed down below the lower band of support. So can this continue down below 83.34? Yeah, it can, but I, I honestly think that if it does do that, that's going to be a capitulation sell-off. And we could head as low as, believe it or not, 71.66 per share. But at that price point, I want to be a buyer. So folks, to wrap it up, going into the new trading year, the issues that haunted the markets in 2022 and, and aggressive Federal Reserve inflation, geopolitical risk, whether it be over in the Ukraine, Russia, China, Taiwan Straits, the Twitter files, deep state, whatever the case may be, they're all still here. None have been resolved. So I would love to say, technically speaking and fundamentally speaking, that it's safe to go back in the water. I've gone over the reasons of as to why I do not believe that it is safe to become an investor. Yet again, unless you're very young, and you have 20, 30 years ahead of you, then you should absolutely be dollar cost averaging. But if you're an investor or a trader, to think that the year is over, down year, okay, let's get long in the market, let's close our eyes, sip a little bit of hopium, and pray that all is right with the world, that's the wrong move to make here. I think that what we need to do is join us tonight, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, on YouTube, Twitter, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it as we open up the futures action. Let's see what the market delivers to us. And we'll talk more about that chart of gold that I think is a screaming buy. And again, you're going to be wondering, why am I not long of this chart or of this product, given the look of this chart? Till tonight, everybody have an awesome day. Be well.